Looking back on As Told by Ginger, I quickly realized that there aren't really very many shows that successfully captured the same kind of energy that this show was able to generate. During the time that this show was airing, from 2000 to 2006, there was a huge wave of new shows on Nickelodeon that would be aimed at a slightly older preteen audience as the network was realizing that their devoted audience of kids were growing up. During that time period, we would see shows like Caitlin's Way, Tana, or the Amanda Show segment Moody's Point airing in an effort to more or less capture the attention of that preteen audience who they thought might not have watched otherwise. Early on in this time period, though, Nickelodeon would launch Teen Nick, the programming block aimed at exactly that audience of preteens and teenagers, and it was chock full of these kind of shows. We would even see a Rugrats spin-off showcasing all of their lives as preteens in middle school. Now, this obviously was nothing new, as when this generation of preteens were just toddlers, Nickelodeon was trying to appeal to their older preteen siblings with shows like Clarissa Explains It All and The Secret World of Alex Mack. However, a majority of those shows would be hailed as classics and really had a lot of character to them. If we fast forward to the early 2000s, to when Teen Nick was first launched, we would see the programming block airing a mixed bag of classic shows and new shows alike. Now, it's obviously subjective, but in my opinion, that didn't do any of these new shows a single favor. I remember on numerous occasions watching Teen Nick and enjoying reruns of, like, I don't know, Keenan and Kel, for example, and the episode comes to an end, and next thing you know, it turns to Caitlin's Way, and I'm just immediately changing it. Don't get me wrong, I gave that show its chance, but it was just insufferable to me, but I'll admit that back then I wasn't, and I still am not that show's targeted demographic. But that's just one example of how hit or miss the shows premiering at that time were. Every once in a while though, there would be a massive diamond in the rough. Case in point, as told by Ginger. This show is one that I feel like was really heavily slept on. It was emotionally gripping and was able to appeal to a very broad audience. If you weren't the kind of person to enjoy the emotional journey that Ginger was on, then usually her wacky little brother Carl was up to something that would likely keep your attention through the episode. Looking back on this show, it's one that really did a great job of teaching life lessons and, in a sense, showing the harsh yet true realities of life when you're growing into adulthood. Whereas Rugrats All Grown Up, for example, was able to teach similar life lessons and show similar realities, it maintained that kind of positive, upbeat vibe that Rugrats always had. Meanwhile, as told by Ginger, conveyed its point in a very different way. If I'm gonna put it blunt, this show taught these life lessons in a way that wasn't afraid to hurt your feelings. Not that the show was like brash or offensive or anything like that, but more in the sense that it wasn't afraid to literally grab you by the heart and straight up rip it from your chest. This show had an amazing way of tackling some really serious topics in a way that was gripping emotionally and honestly very mature for being a kid's cartoon. And that's why today on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're going to check out another episode of As Told by Ginger that really showcases just how well this show could tackle a very serious topic. But first, I just want to say thank you so much for being here and for clicking on this video. Effective immediately, I am implementing a new upload schedule going forward. Instead of dropping videos randomly like I've been doing up to this point, I'm going to be dropping new videos every Friday and Sunday from now on. Honestly, those days might potentially change in the future as I try out new things, but for now, look forward to seeing new videos every Friday and Sunday. So yeah, with that being said, enjoy the video, I'll see you on Sunday for the next one, and let's get right into it. Someone once told me the grass is much greener on the other side. We're looking at the season one episode, Hello Stranger. This episode begins on a cool, crisp fall day with dry leaves all over the ground. Inside the school, we see Ginger, Macy, and Dodie getting ready to go home as Mrs. Zorsky walks up to talk to Ginger about the fall arts festival that she's putting together. So? Did you decide between poems yet? Will it be Girl 13 or Sibling from Mars? The arts fair is rapidly approaching, and I promised a foutly original in the flyer. I know, but I was kind of thinking about writing a new piece. Really? You've been feeling inspired lately. 
Uh, not exactly. But I may be on the brink of some creative breakthrough. Mrs. Zorsky tells Ginger to get to work on the poem as she walks off, and we cut to Ginger who's walking home as she's thinking out loud, really just struggling to come up with an idea that sparks her creativity. As she approaches her house, she stops to grab the mail from the mailbox. Junk. Kill our sea snake, save a buck on cola. <gasps> Tell me it's here! Tell me it's here! Tell me it's here! Uh, uh. Hey! Carl, watch what you're doing! Be forewarned. You are standing between an extremely anxious boy and his dehydrated killer sea snake product. <laughs> Ginger gives Carl his precious dehydrated sea snake as he sprints in the house excitedly. We then cut over to Ginger in her room as she looks at the letter from her dad. Just then, Darren comes in through her window and catches Ginger by surprise. She tells him that she got a letter from her dad, and when he asks what it said, she tells him that she hasn't opened it. Probably for the best. Want me to trash it? I didn't open it yet, Darren, but I am going to open it. He's my dad, okay? Okay, yeah. So what do you think he wants? I don't know, but we're about to find out. Cool. When? Now. Right now. As that's happening, we see Carl down in the kitchen mixing up his dehydrated sea snake while talking to Hoodsy on his walkie-talkie. He elaborates on his plan to grow the snake and train it to kill so that it can eat Brandon Hicksby's pet monkey at the school pet day tomorrow. Carl ends up running off with an evil cackle, and we cut on over to Ginger upstairs reading the card from her dad. It turns out to be a card congratulating her for her graduation from elementary school nearly six months ago. I'm sorry that I haven't been around a whole lot in the past, but I would like to be in the future. Great. But you have to admit, the man's got a funny way of showing it. Darren! I'm serious. Remember when you begged your mom to invite him to Thanksgiving because he said he wanted to come? Then she finally caved in and said yes, and then he, he had, had to, to cancel, cancel because, because something, something came, came up. up. She asks Darren what his point is, and he says that, honestly, he thinks all of this is really great, and he just hopes that nothing comes up this time. Ginger, on the other hand, feels really optimistic and holds on to hope because her dad left his phone number on the card this time. We then cut to downstairs where Ginger's mother, Lois, is getting home from a long day of work. She says that she's parched as she goes into the fridge looking for a drink. Hey, I thought we were out of lemonade! <laughs> Meanwhile, Ginger is upstairs preparing to give her dad a call to talk to him for the first time in years. Darren offers to stay and provide some moral support, but Ginger tells him that she'd rather do this alone. He heads out and wishes her luck as she sits for a sec, having a hard time figuring out what she wants to say to him. Hi dad, this is Ginger. Hi dad, I'm calling because I got your letter. Hi, Dad. I was just looking at a picture of your leg and so thought I'd call. Ginger picks up the phone and she dials her dad's number and after just one ring, it goes right to voicemail and a few seconds later, Ginger hangs up the phone saying that maybe this is a bad idea. Just then, Ginger is startled by the sound of Carl screaming and she goes racing downstairs. Did something bad happen? That may be the understatement of the century. My plans for pet day tomorrow are completely ruined. I got nothing. Oh no, why not bring in your mutant snake mother? That'll amuse the crowd. I will not. Thanks for your concern, Carl. I'm the one who's incubating an invertebrate over here. What are you two talking about? Mom drank my snake! He left it in the fridge! Ginger starts to panic a little bit, and she suggests that her mom call the 1-800 number on the box just to be safe. Carl begs her to ask them for a replacement, and Lois puts down the ban hammer, saying that animals that need an incubation period are no longer allowed in this house. We cut to later that night, where Ginger is sitting in her bed trying to conjure up a poem for the arts fair. Just then, her mom comes in and tells her that it's time for lights out. Ginger tells her mom that she got a letter from dad today, and her mom turns the light back on and comes in to talk to her. 
she tells her mom that she isn't sure if she should call him or not and asks her for her advice. I think you should follow your heart. He may be a little flaky, but he's your father and he's not a bad guy. At some point, you kids are gonna have to decide what role he plays in your lives. Yeah, and just because he wasn't all that reliable in the past, well, that doesn't mean he's always going to be that way, right? I mean, people change. Well, sometimes they do. Now get some shut-eye. As her mom walks down the hall to go back to her room, we see Ginger get lost in her book as the creativity starts to flow. Meanwhile, we see Ginger's mom having a nightmare that she's at work and her stomach is grumbling like crazy. She throws herself back on the table and in a scene right out of the movie Alien, a giant snake bursts out of her abdomen as everyone runs away in fear. Lewis, it's 7.15. Wake up. What? 7.15. Time to wake up. It's 7.15, all you sleepyheads. Time to wake up! Ah! We then cut right on over to the school where we see Carl's class enjoying pet day. His teacher has Brandon at the front of the class as he shows everyone his pet monkey, Mr. Licorice. The teacher is just completely enthralled with the sweet little monkey, but the rest of the class is just kind of over it. She announces that all of the ballots are in and that she's going to go count them in the hall. While she's gone, Carl goes to the front of the class and decides that he's going to terrorize Mr. Licorice. <laughs> We then cut over to the library where Ginger is sitting with her friends and telling them about how she ended up calling her dad and inviting him to the arts festival to hear her read her poem. Her friends are genuinely so excited for her and Macy asks her about what he said when they talked. Well, I didn't exactly speak to him. I left all the details on his voicemail, but he'll be there. Mom and Carl are going to be really surprised. I was thinking the whole family could go out for ice cream together afterwards. Shh. Who knows what that ice cream could lead to? I mean, the family might get back together one day, like on that TV show. I won't tell you girls again! We end up cutting right back over to Carl's class, where we see him lying on the ground with the monkey on top of him. The teacher comes back inside having heard the commotion, and Hoodsy says that Mr. Licorice snapped and bit Carl. Uh, I've never seen him act like that before. He was provoked! Oh, it burns! It, it burns! Somebody, call an ambulance! Hang in there, Carl. Help is on the way. Ah! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> He's turning into a monkey! We then cut right on over to the hospital, where we see Lois admitted and getting checked out by her coworker, Dr. Dave. She gives him the lowdown on what happened and says that the manufacturer said it's no different than going out for a shrimp dinner. Dr. Dave decides that he better do an ultrasound just to be on the safe side. He checks out her stomach and ends up seeing some movement that he admits could just be gas, which she suspects is likely the case due to the fact that she had a grande burrito for dinner last night. However, the doctor says that she needs to stay overnight for some observation. Oh, I can't. My kid's in a production at school. Look, Mom, it's probably nothing, but we're going to have to keep you just to be sure. Doctor's orders, okay? Case closed. <sighs> Dr. Dave, we need you in emergency. A little boy got bit by a monkey and is exhibiting some really strange behavior. Let's go. He wouldn't. Meanwhile, back at Ginger's house, we see her lying on a blanket outside, still working on her poem for the arts fair. Just then, Darren's mom comes out the window to tell her that her mom called and that she's going to have to stay at the hospital overnight. Don't freak! My mom said they just want to keep her for one night to watch her sea snake growth. So, I guess me and Carl are staying alone tonight. Nope, they're keeping Carl too. What? Something about being bit by a monkey at school. Ugh, oh, give me a break. Darren tells Ginger that she's going to be crashing in their guest room tonight so that she doesn't have to stay at home alone, to which Ginger is none too pleased. Darren doesn't understand and is kind of offended until she explains that her dad's coming to the arts fair tonight and she was hoping that Carl and mom would be there so it could be kind of like a surprise reunion. Your dad's coming? I mean, he's, he's actually coming? 
Yes, Darren, he is, okay? I really can't work with you looking over my shoulder, Darren. <laughs> sorry. I mean, sorry. Want the rest of my apple? Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll see you at the arts fair tonight. Bye. Bye. Back over at the hospital, they have Carl locked up in a padded room while the doctors and his mom monitor him from the hallway. He jumps around the room wildly and puts his mouth on the glass, grossing out all the doctors. Everyone walks off, and just then, we see Hoodsy and his mom walk up to visit Carl. He looks diseased. That's how he always looks. I know you can't hear me, Carl, but you're my best friend in the whole wide world. And if anything ever happened to you, I'd spaz really hard, and I'm not just saying that. As Hoodsy shares a touching moment with Carl, he tells him that everyone feels really bad about what happened, especially Brandon, who sent some bananas for Carl. Carl starts to freak out about the bananas, and Hoodsy's mom drags him away, saying that there's no way she's allowing him to go in there to give them to him. After that, we cut right on over to Ginger's mom, who's in her hospital room on the phone. No, no, it, it has to be sunflowers. They're her favorite. Two dozen if you can. Okay, are you sure they can be there in time? Lois, sorry to interrupt, but Monkey Boy wants to know if you're going to finish your banana bread. M yeah, sure, he can have it. And now, would you mind reading that card back to me? Oh, sure thing. It says, Ginger, I'm proud of who you are. All my love, Dad. Yeah, th that's perfect. Thank you. We then cut back on over to the school where the arts fair is underway and Ginger is about to take the stage. Dodie and Macy, who are ushering the event, walk up to Ginger backstage and tell her that they don't see her dad anywhere. However, Ginger doubts them because they've never seen him before. She tells them that he has to be here and that they'll see him afterwards for sure. The two of them go back to work and we see Courtney Grippling get off stage. Mrs. Zorsky takes to the stage to introduce Ginger, who she saved to be the closing act of the night. Hello, stranger. You came just in time. I look for your face in a crowd or in line. Hello, stranger. Not a moment too soon. See, that old picture's fading in the drawer of my room. Now toys have gone lost, baby teeth have come loose, there were accidents involving stitches, spilt juice, report cards were shown, and one time I got sick, but it's nothing I couldn't catch you up on real quick. As Ginger finishes her poem, she scans the room, hoping to see her dad's face in the crowd. However, his face isn't among the sea of people sitting before her. She delivers the final line of her poem and nearly breaks down, feeling heartbroken. But then, the crowd erupts in a round of applause, complete with a standing ovation. Backstage, we see Mrs. Zorsky and Ginger's friends congratulating her on a job well done. Even Darren's entire family was there to support her. He takes a moment to comfort Ginger, trying to give her dad the benefit of the doubt that it was super short notice, and that he didn't actually give her confirmation that he would be there, so he didn't really break a promise. Thanks, Darren. Ginger Foutley! I have delivery for Ginger Foutley. Wow, thanks. Who are they from, Ginger? Who sent them? They're from my dad. Back over at the hospital, we see Lois and Carl sitting in the same room as a nurse walks in. She says that all of their blood work came back just fine, so they're good to go home first thing in the morning. As Carl protests, the phone rings, and he answers it, immediately howling into the phone like a monkey. Ginger calls him weird and asks him to pass the phone to Mom. Hey, I heard you were dynamite! Standing ovation and everything! <laughs> yeah, it was alright. How's your baby sea snake? <laughs> I'm happy to say there'll be no new additions to the Foutley family. But enough about me. I want all the details from Arts Night, and, and don't skip any of the good parts. Okay. But, Ma... Yeah? I just want to... I mean... Thanks for the flowers. I 
I can't lie, you guys, that ending was one of the saddest nuclear mic drops of all time. It's kind of like an unexpected drop on a roller coaster. Like, one second everything's okay and you're happy about the story, then at literally the last three seconds of the episode, they break you and rip your heart out. I'm gonna be honest, when I watched this episode in preparation for this video, I saw that ending and immediately just had to put my head down on my desk and kind of let it out for a bit. I remember seeing this episode as a kid, and that ending had a completely different meaning to me. Seeing Ginger's mom get credit for having the flowers being delivered in the end made me feel really different back then. There was kind of a sense of satisfaction that she got the recognition that she rightfully deserved. However, seeing this not only as an adult, but as a parent myself, it lands a lot differently. There's so many layers here that we're going to peel back and so many moving parts to dissect here. At the heart of this episode, the focal point is Ginger's father being absent. This topic is such a hard one to tackle. This show was on networks that broadcasted to thousands of kids across the world, and a high percentage of those kids were going through this exact scenario or one similar to it. The relationship between Ginger and her father hurts a lot, to be honest. She clearly wants that relationship really badly. She never really got to have that ever since she was a baby, as evidenced by how she only has pictures of his leg in front of her on the ground as opposed to pictures of him holding her. It's really painful how badly that she wants him to care about her, but he just kind of doesn't at this point. She wanted him to be there so badly that she had herself fully convinced that he was going to come to the arts fair even though he never really confirmed that he was going to be there. That says a lot about Ginger and her feelings towards her dad, and it's kind of hard to put that into words that make sense. It's like, he has this long track record of not being there and always having something come up when he's promised to show up, however, when he finally shows even the tiniest gesture in the form of a graduation card that's six months late, she's so willing to take his words at face value and just completely forget about his less than stellar track record in hopes that he's actually wanting to turn a new leaf and be a part of her life this time. It all just reflects how badly that she really wants him to be the dad that she needs, and how much she wants him to be there. In her mind, she sees him as this great guy who's going to be there, and it'll be this happy, nice family reunion that could potentially lead to her parents getting back together, and it's like that in her mind because of how badly she's trying to manifest that. Now, here's the thing though, her having a rough relationship with her dad definitely hurts, that's for sure. It was painful seeing her hopes get up so high just for them to be crushed by him, but what hurt even worse than that is how Lois does everything she can to make up for the fact that her ex doesn't care about his kids. Lois honestly is such a great mom. Considering the kind of job that she has and the fact that she's a single mother, she does an amazing job and I feel like she does things with the best of intentions, especially when it concerns her children. She tries selflessly to give Ginger hope for her father to someday be involved in her life. She jumps through hoops and even goes as far as ordering flowers to be delivered in his name just to make it seem as though he actually got Ginger's message and that he cared. That says so much about Lois as a person and as a mother. Now, I'm sure there's some resentment towards Ginger's dad from Lois, and rightfully so. They used to have a family together until he straight up bailed and abandoned all of them. However, Lois sets that resentment aside to preserve Ginger's worldview and her image of her dad in her mind. Lois doesn't even badmouth him and goes as far as saying that he's not a bad guy. I mean, all in all, Lois is really doing him a favor and trying to paint him in a good light while he's being an absentee father in hopes that when he does hopefully come around and decide to come back and be part of his kid's life, that the bridge isn't completely burned. Meanwhile, he never really did her any favors, clearly. Regardless of that, though, the point is that this never really came from a place of wanting to do him a favor and help him. For Lois, this is purely about Ginger and doing everything she can to support her and make her feel better about the situation in any way that she can. It's bad enough to her that Lois herself couldn't make it to the arts fair. She didn't want Ginger to be completely heartbroken about the fact that no one in her family was able to make it. 
Another big point that's shown a lot in this show is how much of a struggling artist that Ginger is. She's a really complex girl who carries around a lot of really complicated feelings, and one of her strongest ways to let out some of those emotions is through her writing. That would be a constant theme throughout the series. Ginger is a fantastic author for such a young girl, and more often than not, her best work comes out when she's writing about her struggles. About six months ago, I made a video about this show covering the episode where Ginger writes a sad story and ends up being required to get therapy for depression as a result of it. It was a really great episode, and I really like how that video turned out, but at its core, much like this episode, Ginger was using her writing as an outlet for her emotions. The biggest similarity between the two episodes being Ginger struggling to write about something that makes her happy, but then when she ends up feeling emotional, she lets those emotions bleed onto those pages, and next thing you know, she has an award-winning paper in her hands. That's a really interesting character trait about Ginger. Writing about happy things just doesn't flow all too naturally for her, and it just feels forced. It just doesn't spark her creativity. In this episode, of course, her muse would be her feelings towards her father, who's been absent her entire life. One thing that I really want to point out is that I enjoy the way that they laid the foundation for our understanding of Ginger's relationship with her father. In the beginning, we see her having anxiety about getting a letter from her dad. However, despite that, upon opening the letter and getting that bit of hope, she remains persistent in her positivity. Contrary to Darren, who is honestly very brash and insensitive with his realism. He's skeptical of Ginger's dad from the start, and refuses to hold out any hope or give him the benefit of the doubt, but he also at least makes a half-hearted attempt to walk the fine line of trying not to be too big of a downer about it for the sake of Ginger not losing hope. Honestly, Darren's interactions with Ginger throughout this episode are kind of mixed in my opinion. Like, in the beginning, he's kind of weird with how he is about Ginger's dad. He starts out kind of insensitive about the whole thing, then by the end of the episode, we see him playing devil's advocate and trying to remind Ginger that her dad didn't really break a promise because he didn't make that promise in the first place. It's a tough one, and I feel like at this point, Darren has nothing but good intentions, however, he's really awkward and not very good with words, so he comes across really brash. Moving on from there, I definitely have to touch on the Carl aspect of this episode. His story arc in this one was the part that I enjoyed as a kid. Honestly, I'll admit that when I was younger, I wasn't the hugest fan of this show. Like, I remember watching it because it would always suck me in, but I never really was a big fan of the ginger portion of the episode. I was more interested in what Carl had going on. Nowadays, honestly, it's kind of the opposite, which is funny to me, but regardless, I still enjoy Carl's story in this one. As a kid, I enjoyed Carl as a character because I could relate to him in a way considering that I was also kind of a weird kid. I love the fact that Lois is surprised that he put the sea snake water in the juice pitcher in the fridge. Like, of course he put it there. Where else was he going to put it? I also really love that scene where Ginger comes downstairs to find Carl just in awe that his sea snake is gone. Meanwhile, Lois is straight up just in pure shock thinking that her body is incubating a snake. When we fast forward to her at the hospital getting an ultrasound, I gotta point out that the doctor was kind of sus. The way that he said that it's probably nothing but he should keep her overnight for observation seemed maybe a little bit suggestive and kind of creepy. What's funny too is that odds are that's likely the case as, spoiler alert, later on in the series Ginger's mother would end up falling in love with this same doctor and becoming his wife. At this point, this would be the first time we would see the two of them interact in the series, but seeing this scene and knowing now what happens later on, I feel like they were definitely hinting at Dr. Dave being attracted to Lois. I also have to point out this scene right here. When we see Carl jumping around the padded room and howling like a monkey, meanwhile the doctors and his mother are outside the window watching him. There's just something about this scene. I don't know what it is, but this right here really reminded me that I was watching a Klasky Chupo cartoon. It just has this certain type of feel if you know what I mean. I don't know if it's the way they drew the doctors here or if it's just the zany antics, but it just really has that classic Klasky Chupo feeling and I really appreciate that. If there's anything else that I wanted to touch on, it would be the fact that Hoodsy is such an absolute sweetheart of a best friend. He comes to visit Carl in the emergency room and has a touching heart-to-heart -heart moment with him, and you can tell that Hoodsy genuinely cares about Carl. It's just a really sweet and touching moment that I felt like needed to be talked about. 
Hoodsy is a ride or die friend to Carl, much like Heifer from Rocco's Modern Life. I feel like Hoodsy is the friend that would always be there to have your back no matter what. He was even willing to go into the padded room to give Carl the bananas himself, confident that Carl wouldn't attack him even in his current primate state of mind. All in all, I can say this much. As Told by Ginger was a show that really had a special sauce to it. It was really impressive how it was able to be so universally likable. It was able to tell such serious stories, all the meanwhile having a subplot that could be applicable to a completely different audience, yet enjoyed by all. And on top of that, there was usually a great moral to the story at the end of each episode. But what do you think? Did you enjoy the show as a kid? Do you want to see more videos about this show? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love seeing your guys' feedback. I gotta give some love of course to my patrons, and specifically those of you in the true 90s kids tier. Thank you so much for your support, and you guys are the absolute greatest ever. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to drop a like and maybe do a rain dance for the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it rains views upon this video, and as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace.